Okay, today I'm here to talk to you about your running shoes. Now take a look at yours. How much cushioning do yours have? Now, unless you're running barefoot or with minimalist running shoes, I'd imagine quite a bit. Now here's mine. Yeah, fair old wedge there. But I love these shoes. The idea behind all this cushioning is it's there to absorb and manage the impact loading from running and reduce injuries. That's the idea anyway. But what if I told you this cushioning may well be doing the opposite of that? Well, that's what some experts out there are trying to find out. And today I'm going to be investigating it too. Now to begin this little investigation, we're gonna start right back at the beginning to the caveman era in fact. Now a caveman would go out and hunt its own food and run miles per day to do that completely barefoot in what we call unshod running. Now if we race forward many years to the 18th century and by this point, more or less everyone's wearing footwear for their day-to-day -day activities and for running. Now these initial running shoes were not only very minimalist, but they were made completely from leather, which meant when they got wet, they did straight stretch and lose their shape quite considerably. But a breakthrough was made in 1832 by Waite Webster when he attached rubber to the soles of these shoes. And then 20 years later, spikes were added to the bottoms of these shoes in an attempt to add more traction and grip between the foot and the ground. This was done by the founder of the Bolton company, Joseph William Foster. That company then became Reebok. And from there, running became increasingly more popular when marathon running was added to the Olympic Games in 1896. Manufacturers responded to this by trying to make footwear that was specific to the individual sports. With that, they were attempted to make footwear lighter, quieter, and more flexible. And from that, in 1917, it was Goodyear actually that came out with the sneaker. Now this was a shoe that apparently runners could sneak about in soundlessly. And then the 1920s and 30s were a really exciting era for the running shoe. So many developments happened. The most significant being that they were trying to make shoes specific to the runner's needs, whether they were a sprinter or a long distance runner. And this is where Adolf Dazzler, the founder of Adidas steps in because he did it superbly and his footwear became internationally recognized and known and even acknowledged by some of the best athletes in the sport, such as Jesse Owens. And then as we race forward into the 1960s, shoes such as the New Balance Trackster pushed developments further. We had varying shoe whips, we had rippled outsoles for grip and increased shock absorption. And then a step in Nike. In the 70s, running just exploded with thanks to the jogging boom and Bill Bowerman of Nike became obsessed with the idea of lightweight shoes for running and the technology that went into them. And so much so, he experimented with melting rubber in his waffle iron and created a new sole that became internationally recognized when Steve Prefontaine wore them in 1973. And then in 1987, Nike shocked the world with their Nike Air Max, the first pair of sneakers to feature a visible air cushion as a shock absorber. And from here, the growth and popularity of cushion shoes just took off. Today, pretty much all shoes feature some form of stabilization, support, or heel cushioning. Now, why is this all important? Well, as you've seen, running shoes have changed considerably over the years. We started out with, well, nothing. Then we went to lightweight minimalist running shoes and all the way to today where most of the shoes we see are really well cushioned, particularly so when we look at some of the shoes like the Nike Vaporfly Next Percent or even the Alpha Fly. But all of this is being done by manufacturers because they genuinely believe they're doing the best for the runner and responding to runner's needs. But are they really doing that? Well, I think it's time for me to bring in an expert here. I've got Dr. Hannah Rice from the University of Exeter. She is a lecturer in biomechanics and interestingly also involved in a study that looked at the influence of footwear and foot strikes on load rates during running. Now foot strike during running, by that we mean how do you contact the ground each time you, you land? So around three quarters of people will contact the ground landing on their heel first whereas the remaining quarter or so will land with a more anterior foot strike. So a mid foot strike or a four foot strike, for example. Now, when you contact the ground, there's a ground reaction force. And as biomechanists, we often measure the forces. And these appear to be different when you land with a rear foot strike compared with a more anterior foot strike. So we see this particular shape of curve and rear foot strikers have this initial peak that seems to be absent in more anterior foot strikes in general. 
Now what that means is that the steepness of the curve, which we call the loading rate, is different, that, that initial curve, the steepness is different between these different runners. And that is an, a variable that has de been deemed important because of, it's been argued to be associated with injury. And what we found is that people who run with a more anterior foot strike, so a forefoot strike, whilst in minimalist shoes, had lower rates of loading than people who were running in standard shoes, even if they were running with a forefoot strike. So this suggested that the footwear or and perhaps the cushioning influenced loading rates in a, in a way that might be different to just foot strike. And this is where some argue that with this increased cushioning and stack height, it can actually force you to run slightly differently with a different technique. If you think about it, you've got this increased cushioning and stack height, it does seem quite inviting, this nice cushy heel. Why not heel strike? But as Dr. Rice pointed out and she found from her study, they did find that with heel strikers, they had an increased initial impact and force. And that's gonna be then sent up through the body. When you compare that to a barefoot runner or someone running with more minimalist running shoes, they're going to avoid striking with their heel at all costs because it's going to hurt. They therefore go for a slightly more anterior form, so going towards their midfoot and forefoot. But the interesting bit that she did touch on, I thought this was fascinating, is that even when they took both runners, both the barefoot or minimalist runners and the well-cushioned shoe runners, to run with a more midfoot or forefoot form, it was actually those that ran in the cushion shoes that still had the higher initial impact. Now that's left me puzzled. So I've actually gone and reached out to a good friend of mine, David Jewell, who is a self-confessed shoe addict, and he's been involved in the shoe running industry for a number of decades. Running shoes are simply a tool. They're a tool that gets you from point A to point B, and that's why we love them. That's why we love the fact that we can buy a running shoe and, and go run. But the running shoe is just a tool. It's a tool that works with your running form. And if your running form demands that you need maximum cushion right now, then that's what it demands. And I think it's, I think they're the right shoes. And, and clearly right now, because of the demand for maximum cushion, the brands are answering. They're, We'd love to think that the brands are forward thinking and really looking out at what a runner's gonna need five and 10 years from now. But really, I, really they are reacting. They are reacting to the demand of the runner. And right now the runners are demanding more cushion. Why runners are different and why a runner might demand maximum cushioning versus a runner might demand or need or want a lightweight training shoe there's a perfect example in the sport of triathlon. Daniela Reef won the Ironman World Championships the, for the very first time in the ASICS Gel Nimbus. The most cushion that ASICS offered at that time. Her running form demanded that she wear that shoe. She muscled her way through that run course. Subsequently, she's worked on her running form and she's become a runner. And because of that, she's doing Kona in a racing flat. And that's really two different Daniela's. It's two different runners. It's one runner that, because of her running form, demanded that she wear a maximum cushion running shoe. And it's a second runner now that can get away with running as little as possible shoe as, as there is. Well, I can totally side with this. When I first got into running, I had to wear very cushioned running shoes. Over time though, I improved my technique. I was able to take away some of that cushioning and structure from the running shoes. I was even starting to race in very lightweight and minimal race flats. To get to that point, I was doing toe scrunches. I was doing drills regularly. I was doing ankle strengthening with TheraBands. Fast forward to now, and I'm not doing any of that. I'm not running anywhere near as much, definitely not doing any drills. And guess what? I need more cushioned shoes again. So what's happened here? Have my ankles and feet become weaker? Have I lost the muscle in them? Now, the argument, what happens if you wear these more cushioned shoes? Do you have atrophy of the muscles in the foot? And is that the, the root of all our injury problems? I mean, I think the, the hypothesis is sound. It, it has um, intuitive logic. It, make, it would make sense. 
but there is not the evidence to support that. So there's some great research being done at the University of Queensland and with my colleague and Exeter Dom Farris looking at um, the role of those intrinsic muscles in the foot. There has been very little to say that these muscles atrophy as a result of kind of wearing cushion shoes, although I think there is some evidence to suggest that if you go through periods of, for example, um, barefoot walking training, you see um, hypertrophy or increase in size of the intrinsic foot muscles. But again, can we say therefore that that reduces the risk of injury? We can't yet because that the research doesn't exist. And it's this last section where one of the big questions and arguments lies. Now, if you were to speak to some hardcore barefoot folk out there, they would tell you that cavemen used to run miles per day in search of their food, hunting for their food, totally barefoot and unshod. But I would point out, we don't have records of the injury rates. The same goes for the minimalist shoes that we saw from the early 18th century and the early 1900s. They would even do marathons in those super thin shoes. Again, we don't have records of their injury rates. And I would also point out that there are far more runners these days that are heading out and doing part runs and whatnot. So, are cushion shoes making you injured? Well, Unfortunately, I can't really close the book with a definite and conclusive answer today. I think that would be foolish of me. I will leave that to the experts with their ongoing studies. Personally though, what I have taken from this is that yes, many of us are reaching for the more cushioned shoes when we need them and that is absolutely fine. I've done the same. But I guess there is that worry that as you do that, you then rely upon that cushioning and it's just a downward spiral, needing more and more cushioning. What I'm gonna do going away from this is actually seeing the fact that I'm already reaching for more cushioning. I'm gonna work on my technique. I'm gonna start doing more drills, some more strengthening, some of the things I used to do to ultimately and hopefully become a more efficient runner again and require less cushioning in my shoes. I'll report back at a later date with that. But I hope you have enjoyed today's video. Make sure you give us a like. And if you would like to see more from GTN, make sure you're following us on all our social channels.